I thank you for joining me today as we talk about defending our networks in a space that's prone to budget cuts. So when I look at today's information security landscape, I'm reminded a bit of the Battle of Thermopylae. For those that aren't familiar, the Battle of Thermopylae was where roughly 300 Spartans, Spartan soldiers, held off hundreds of thousands of Persian invaders, including the famed Persian immortals. The 300 Spartans were the cyber poor. They didn't have the same resources that the rest of the Greek military had. Yet, they were able to use what they had to hold off the Persians and eventually allow the Athenians to win. One of the keys to the Spartan victory had to do with their culture. They were highly focused on training to be a warrior. It's what they lived every day. When your funds have been cut or have never been there to begin with, you have to be a cybersecurity warrior. You have to live your work life focused on, defending the, on defeating the enemy. In the Battle of Thermopylae, the Persians were the enemy, at least from the Greek point of view. In our day-to-day -day work battles, attackers, office politics, and budgets are often our enemies. So let's go ahead and make the distinction up front between the cyber rich and the cyber poor. I'm not using these terms to pick groups against each other or be derogatory towards one group. It's just a fact that the Global 2000 and the federal government can afford better security tools and more talent than the hundreds of thousands of other companies out there. However, even their budgets get slashed since information security is looked at as more of a cost center or an insurance policy than anything else. And I'm hoping we get past these labels one day, but for now it's what we're stuck with. It's important to recognize that cyber poverty exists and it's a problem. It's not just a problem for the business that can't afford the best security tools. It's a problem for the consumers of their products. And that consumer may be even a company that's part of the cyber rich. So in the Battle of Thermopylae, the gap in the Spartan defense was a trail that allowed the Persians to flank them. And this was something that was revealed to Xerxes, the Persian king, by a former Spartan. If you're one of the cyber rich, that's great. However, I'm sure you work with plenty of outsourced vendors that are cyber poor, and it creates a gap in your security program. Customer information is held by a lot of these companies, and they're easy targets for attackers. Attackers realize that it's much easier to subvert a smaller company than a larger one. And that doesn't mean that larger companies can relax, because they're the, they're the whales in an attack, where the smaller businesses, including mom and pop shops, are the low-hanging fruit. So what can be done about this problem? It's something that can't be solved individually. It's not even something that can be solved at the individual company level. When the Spartans fought off the Persians, they were doing it so that the Athenians and the rest of Greece could have, have the time to prepare for battle. This was a group effort, and at the time, many of the Greek city-states were not united. However, there were plenty that realized they had a common enemy in the Persians. And it was the common enemy that helped them to defend themselves from the invasion. We have to start working as a security community and sharing stories and data, not just disclosing data after a breach, and I'll get into safe ways to share this information a little bit later. We can look to different open source software to help fill in gaps in our current security programs. And this isn't going to be the end-all be-all fix. This is just the Spartans holding off the Persians. And there are pros and cons to using open source software, and we'll take a look at this in a bit. We can invest more time in training and learning to mature the craft of information security. And I know it can be difficult to find the time to train, but if you want to be a modern-day Spartan, you'll need to hone your skills. The Spartans trained constantly to be warriors. This was ingrained in them since childhood. They made the time to train, and it paid off in the ability to use less resources and still remain a strong defense. We need to take a look at how we spend our time during the day. Are we doing things as efficiently as possible? And for organizations that can't afford to hire large staff for information security, we need to make sure we budgeted our time. We also need to make sure that our process is documented. Again, I understand that this can eat into the time you already have too little of, but sometimes we need to spend the time up front to save us time in the future. Making sure there is a documented process 
not only make sure that your knowledge can be passed along to others, but that you can refer to the process when you have so much on your mind that you're not sure what to do next. And having a baseline process will also allow you to tweak the process over time so that you can find deficiencies and improve upon them. This will also help with my next point, which is documenting return on investment in business terms. This is what the people who cut the checks understand. So how much are you saving them in money with a new tool or a new person, and how much are you reducing risk? Show the actual value with facts. It will be much easier to get them to loosen up the wallet later on. And I understand there, this will be a large undertaking for many of you, and it won't happen overnight, so we really have to learn to enjoy the process of setting this all up. Okay, let's start with open, so, open source software. I'm definitely not an open source expert, so I'm just going to talk about some of the software that is a bit more popular. If we want to look at the software from a Spartan's perspective, this is the pass between the sea and the mountain range that made it too narrow for the Persians to send all of their forces at once. This was a tool that they used to their advantage, and it was free. It cost them nothing. They had the knowledge of the landscape, and it allowed them to make the Persians concentrate all of their forces into a smaller area. So let's talk about the upsides of open source software. The biggest one is that it's free. Another is that it's monitored by a community of security experts and the people that use the tools day in and day out. A lot of these experts even contribute back to the code. The downside is the lack of support. However, this could be supplemented with professional services from a partner. We're going to get more into leveraging partners and vendors later, but for now we'll just acknowledge that they can provide services to supplement the lack of enterprise support. Another potential downside is that the code is open to another level of security experts, but unfortunately these experts are also your adversaries, and having exposed code allows attackers to find zero-day exploits much easier. It allows them to better understand and how to subvert the tool. And we can work around this by utilizing layers of open source software to fill in gaps where commercial products are, um, but I wouldn't recommend having a completely open source security tool program. Okay, let's start with some of the tried and true open source security tools. These will probably be known to most of you, but I still think it's important to call them out uh, to those that might be newer to the industry or might not have had the time to look into these tools. So Snort. Snort's an open source intrusion detection and prevention system. It's been around for almost two decades, and there's a full community of people that support it. There's a language for writing Snort rules so that the rules can be shared throughout the community. ClamAV. ClamAV is an open source antivirus engine. It's currently maintained by Cisco's Talos Threat Research Group. It works on almost all platforms, and like Snort, it's been around for a while. Cuckoo Sandbox provides sandboxing and malware analysis. It's community supported and maintained by a team that donates their time. So this one is fully volunteer. The Elk Stack is actually three separate open source products that provide an open source log server. It consists of Kibana, uh, that's the user interface portion of it, Elasticsearch, which is the distributed search analytics engine, and then Logstash, which is the data collection piece of the stack. Now many commercial vulnerability scanning companies also offer, offer a freeware version of their products, but you need to make sure that you read the license to know if you can use the scanner in a business setting. If you're looking for an open source vulnerability scanner, there's OpenVAS or OpenVAS. Open source security tools aren't just limited to defense. Actually, most of them are offensive, um, and they're used for testing your network. So Metasploit is an exploitation framework. Uh, the framework itself is open source. However, the interfaces for it are not all open source. The framework's owned and supported by Rapid7. They offer a community edition of the interface uh, for this, which is free. And then uh, there's Armitage, which is the uh, free and open source GUI tool that you can use for this. Uh, if you're trying to raise user awareness around phishing and spear phishing attacks, the Social Engineer Toolkit makes creating and running the attack easier than it should be. Um, I actually walked a group of non-security people through this, and they were able to do an exploit within about five minutes. The important thing to keep in mind when looking into open source is that any, 
that there will be a time trade-off for the implementation. And then there's also the support, too. They still aren't much use to you if your team, uh, if you and your team don't have the knowledge to support them properly. So there's always going to be that time trade-off whenever you're using open source. The Spartans were really the only group in ancient Greece that had professional warriors. All the other city-states used people that had other jobs. Uh, some were artisans, and then some were farmers, and they'd fight in the military only when they were needed. They didn't train, and so they didn't have the skills that the Spartans had. Training was probably the biggest thing that made the Spartans so formidable. They took the time to learn and refine their craft. And this is what made them the infamous warriors that they were. In the same sense, you should take the time to train in your craft. And I know that we all have time and budget constraints, but the time and money you invest in training will pay off over time. Continued learning is important for a few reasons. Uh, so stagnation leads to boredom and continuing to work inefficiently. Stagnation and boredom are career killers, and for the managers in the room, they will drive away your people. Keeping your team, or in the case of the underfunded, your person, keeping them trained will keep them happy and have a higher rate of job satisfaction. And I know that most of the analysts I talk to love to learn, and the hard part goes back to the time and money problem. So let's look at those. To get around the issue of money, you look into things like cross-training, users groups, and virtual training. So cross-training is going to help with the time problem. If you train someone enough to do the very basics of your job, you'll be able to dedicate more time to further training. You'll have somebody to cover you while you're gone. Cross-training will also help to create empathy between employees and departments. It can even give you insight into security vulnerabilities within other parts of your organization by taking the time to see the workflow of other groups. So local users groups are a great way to get some product-specific training, especially if it's a vendor-run users group. They're also a good way to interact with your peers and share problems and experiences. If it's a vendor-run user group, make sure that they're provi providing more than just food and alcohol. Make sure that they're giving you product-specific information and answering questions you have on that product. Make sure that the vendor is facilitating conversations about the information security industry. Now, virtual training is a good option for the organizations that can spare a little bit of budget uh, instead of formal training. Virtual instructor-led training is usually cheaper than in-person training, and it can be done from anywhere. My suggestion is to make sure you do the training wherever you normally do work, and don't take the training from your couch or your bed at home because you'll find other distractions and the money and time investment will, will be lost on you. So it's going to be able, it's going to be important that you're able to show your employer the return on investment in training. And not paying attention can help guarantee that you'll get less or no training in the future. Now making sure that you're going to quality training that is also the right training will make sure that the time travel and monetary investments are, you're making are good ones. So a stock trader doesn't just pick a random stock and then invest in it. They research the stock to determine if it's worth the investment. You should do the same with training. So with budget, time, and travel all being considerations, your ability to justify the expense of all three of these will be important to getting future training. This justification starts with researching the training ahead of time. Uh, however, before researching, we might want to identify some metrics. These metrics are going to vary, but we can look at, at some of the questions that might help you determine them. So what skills are gained from the training? Will those skills increase efficiency? Will those skills make you better at your job? Will those skills help with future projects and plans for your organization? What's the expected impact of job performance? How will this training save future time and money? What will your return on investment be in both time and money? When you're considering registering for training, you want to, be, you want to have some questions in mind to help determine if the training is right for you. And some of those questions may look like, who are the instructors? Do they have a good reputation? Are they known for being able to convey information easily and effectively, or do they put their audiences to sleep? What do others say about the course? Are you able to find any reviews online that discuss the instructor or the course itself? Do other people that have taken the course find that the information that they've learned is valuable and was it worth their return on investment? 
Does the course line up with any certifications? If the outcome of the course is to have you ready to take a certification, how will this apply to your job or your personal brand? Are they teaching just for the certification, or is it going to be information you can put into practice as well? And then what are the sources used for creating training? Where are the course developers getting their information from? Is it, if it's just from experience, what does that experience look like? Unfortunately, experience can lead to anecdotal evidence, and this isn't always the case, but it's something to keep in mind. There's always going to be a time problem. I know that all of you already have a busy enough schedule, but taking the time to train can help you be more efficient at what you do. It can help save future time. Think of it as making an upfront investment in time, kind of like taking the time to do a proper setup and documentation of your security tools. If you still aren't convinced that you have the time, please just put that aside for one course, take the course, come back and see what you really missed. I'm sure the company will still be running. In most cases, I'm sure the building will still be standing. A lot of people complain about not having enough time for their job, and I believe for the most part that is true, but I also think it also has to do with a lot of inefficiencies. People either spend too much time on the wrong things, or they get sidetracked going down rabbit holes. If you really want to know where your inefficiencies lie, you're going to have to be honest with yourself. You'll have to determine where your strengths and weaknesses are, you're going to make a list if this helps. So if, if you can't just sit down and think about it, you want to create a list of this. Focus on doing your strengths and improving or delegating your weaknesses. Monitor the amount of time you're spending on different tasks. Stop watching or use software for tracking if you have to. Then do this for a few days and then review the information you've collected. I know it feels a little odd to be talking about workflow and finding ways to improve efficiencies at a security conference, but I feel like this can help toward reclaiming time and help the security industry as a whole. Because when you're working in an understaffed role because your organization can't afford to hire more people, time becomes very important. That's why we're going to divert here for a minute and talk about finding workflows and ways to become efficient. I strive to be super efficient because I understand how valuable time can be. For my job, I do a lot of travel and when I'm home, I'm often working. However, I have a wife and two young children that need me to be present. This is why I value my time, and this is why I try to use the most of it and get things done as efficiently as possible. So here are the few, a few of the things that I do to try and reclaim my time. First, I want to dismiss the notion of multitasking. No one can multitask well. If you want to do something well, you have to maintain focus. And if you're multitasking, you're either splitting that focus or you're diverting it. So doing something well requires 100% focus. And if you're splitting your attention, you can't do that well. You, it's only going to lead mistakes and forgetting pieces of the task. So while you're working, let's focus on one thing at a time. I know it might sound counterintuitive, but it works. I can do five things at a time poorly and slowly because I'm always trying to remember where I am on a certain task or I can pick one thing at a time, do the work with 100% focus, and then move on to the next task with speed and intent. If I can suggest that you read or listen to one book on workflow and efficiencies, I would suggest Getting Things Done by David Allen. This will give you an overall framework for getting through work and doing the work you do well. Now, there's a website that's a bit of a companion to this. It wasn't created by the author, but it helps put his framework in action in a technological way. The website is thesecretweapon.org. .org. .com is a malware site. Make sure you go to .org. Using, using the getting things done framework in this way may not be for everyone, or you may have to modify it a bit. I've used a modified version of the secret weapon for uh, several years now, and it's really helped to improve my workflow. I used to spend too much of my time trying to remember specifics about a task, or just trying to think of what am I supposed to do next, because it all gets so overwhelming and You've got a, a huge list of tasks to do. You don't know what to do. So this helped me with a lot of that, and it helped to make sure that things weren't forgotten. Another book that helped with my workflow was a book called Eat That Frog. You can read it if you want, but I'll summarize. Do the things you want to do least first. And this speech is a great example of that. I love doing these talks, but planning for them can be tedious. Uh, writing, editing, slide design, rehearsing, 
there's a lot of work that is put into, into this just for 40 minutes. And I hate doing most of it. Uh, and that's why every morning I start my work day by working on this presentation. Another thing that I do when I'm performing a task that, is, uh, that has an opportunity to monopolize my time is, uh, and especially if it's something that shouldn't, is to time box it. So by that I mean I simply set a timer uh, and do that task for that specified amount of time. So for this talk, I spent, I'd set a timer for 20 to 30 minutes each morning. I'd write for that entire amount of time, and then when that timer went off, I finished, and I moved on to what I needed to do for the rest of the day. Space this out over enough time, the task gets done, and it hasn't taken up entire days. So also make a plan daily. Uh, determine what your day will look like by prioritizing tasks. You can do this by determining which tasks are urgent, which tasks are important, and which tasks you want to do the least. Looking at a task from these angles should help you decide where in your day you'll perform them. Now, I don't want to spend much more time on workflow and being efficient, but I will share one last point with you before we move on. Start your day with something that inspires or motivates you. And so despite how it may look, I work out five days a week, every morning, hour and a half to two hours a day, I go to the gym, and it gets me pumped up for my work day. And uh, I found that working out gives me that pump the rest of the day, it helps motivate me, and it could be the actual workout, the music that I listen to, the 350 milligrams of caffeine in my pre-workout, um, or a combination of all of them, but it helps motivate me and I can push through the work and hustle that much faster than I could otherwise. Now, as you're working through finding your efficiencies and the best way for you to do things, document those things. Document your best practices, how tools are implemented, and build an actual security program. At first, you want to document in a way that is most natural and easiest for you, and this way you can build the habit of documentation. So this could be video, could be writing, it could be recording audio, whatever works best for you. Don't worry about being formal at this point, just get the work, uh, get work on getting the information out of your head. Uh, once it's out, you can clean it up later, uh, and format it properly for others to consume. So everybody consumes information in a different way. Audio, video, text. So I personally like video. I like being able to answer questions with a quick link. Uh, however, not everyone consumes information that easily through video. So when time permits, I'll go back and put it in other formats. I'll take the audio from that video, make it a podcast, or make it a WAV file, MP3, that they can, they can listen to whenever, wherever. Uh, and then I'll write it out. So when you're starting or restarting to build out your information security program, you want to look at what resources you already have. Evaluate if you're getting what you should from those resources in terms of savings and intelligence gathering. And determine if the tools you have in place are really providing value or if they're just another tool that's creating noise and taking up space. Maybe nobody's using them or even worse, it's wasting the time of the people using them. This whole process is going to require a lot of honesty with yourself and honesty with your team. If the tool is useless, stop using it and get rid of it. If you think that the tool is useless now, but with a bit more tweaking or tuning, it could really help, then salvage it by dedicating some professional resources dollars towards it. Again, this takes real honesty. Don't throw good money after bad to try and fix a poor decision or save face. This can save money in terms of technological resource use, licensing, or maintenance fees, or time spent not only using the tool but maintaining it. I know it can be hard to admit that an idea someone had at one point may not be good anymore. And it might have been good at a certain point in time, but businesses evolve over time, security programs evolve over time, threats evolve over time, your tools are going to evolve over time. So once you've evaluated what you already have at your disposal, identify the gaps. By the way, you should be documenting all of this. You'll need to justify the changes. You'll need to explain risk. You'll need it to explain return on investment. You'll need it for cross-training and onboarding. You'll need this documentation for a lot of different things that can be reused. Don't let these things take up space in your head. Get them on, onto paper, video, or audio. Again, whatever's the easiest for you to document. So next, evaluate the tools, people, or processes that can fill in the gaps that we identified earlier. 
Can some of the tools you already have in place cover some of the gaps? By the way, if you aren't sure or don't have the time to figure that piece out, if those tools can uh, cover those gaps, then talk to your vendor. A good vendor should be more than willing to help you find solutions to your problems with the tools that they already sold you. Worst case scenario, they'll point you in the direction of another tool that could fill in that gap. Is there someone in your organization that's being underutilized? Is there a way that could help manually cover that gap until a tool can be put in place? If so, make sure you document how much it costs the company to manually have that person doing that job. Because it's going to help you justify that tool purchase down the road. Next, we can look at process. So will a simple process change help address the existing gap? Sometimes organizations are bloated or misguided with process. And just changing or tweaking it a little bit can help alleviate some of those problems. Some things you want to keep in mind as you begin to build or rebuild your security program. What are your company's goals? You have to align your goals and mission with this. What's the mission of your security operations team? Make your mission short and clear. For WITFU, we began the company with a simple mission to mature the craft of information security. Every choice we make, we make sure it aligns with that mission. If you want to borrow this mission for your security team, go ahead. It's something you want to make, it's something that you're going to want to reference in every decision that you make. Document. Again, I cannot stress this enough. When we first began WITFU, and I was chosen to take over all of the pre and post sales support, I started by writing the customer success manifesto. I didn't get into the weeds of being super detailed in, pro in process and how we're going to do everything, at least until the end of the document. I wanted to get my general ideas and beliefs down on paper first. And I made sure that every line of that document lined up with our mission. Then I shared it with the rest of the department heads to get their input, just to make sure I wasn't in my own bubble, make sure that it aligned with, aligned with the mission. So this document I can easily refer to if I forget where I initially wanted the department to go. I can also point my new hires to this, too, when I'm onboarding. I can't tell you the precise ways or tactics of building your security program, since each of you are going to have different needs and you're going to have different missions. I can only give these general guidelines, but I will share my contact information at the end, and I'd be happy to answer questions you have on your specific needs. So working in sales for several years now, I've noticed that most security analysts have a hard time relaying the value of a tool in business terms. It's for good reason, too. It's probably not something you were taught. It's probably not part of your day-to-day -day job. And even more importantly, it's probably something you really don't even care about. But it's something you should care about, and here's why. The people that cut the checks for that cool new tool that you want, it's all they care about. They only think in terms of return on investment and reduction of risk. So when you're testing out or doing a proof of concept for that new tool that you want to buy, try thinking, it from the point, thinking of it from the point of view of the people that are giving the approval on that budget. Of course, this is on top of you having to put on your security analyst hat and make sure that tool actually does what you need it to do for your job. Make sure that you're documenting what you weren't able to do without this tool. How many events are you seeing? How many false positives? How much time did your team have to spend investigating those events? Remember that the return on investment doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can, be, it can come in time saved. Because the more time you can save, the less your department needs to spend in headcount. And this is a measurable thing that you can present to leadership. So my friend and CEO of WITFU, Charles Herring, he gave a talk here a couple years back. Uh, you might remember it as the boring flowchart talk, but it goes into detail of the exact process of how to do this. And I think the video is probably still up online, too. But it'll go through the, the process of looking at your security tools, how much events are you getting, how much time are you spending, and what does that look like in headcount. So here's a big way to save time and money that not many people talk about, but it's vendor communication and utilization. I've worked on the vendor side for most of my career in security, and it's given me the opportunity to see lots of environments and work with a lot of different security people. Uh, best of all, it's given me the, op the opportunity to actually help. Um, and I've got to help security departments all over the country, too. This help isn't always just selling them a new tool. There's been plenty of meetings where I've told customers, don't buy what I'm selling. It's not what you need. 
Um, and it, it gives me the opportunity to do more than just fix the tool that they bought from me as well. So I like to think of myself as more of a consultant to these customers. And that's the approach that you should be demanding of your vendors. You should be asking them to help fit the tools that they sold you into your security program. You should be asking them, how can this tool help me reduce false positives and time in my environment? Or is it just going to add more noise and work to maintain and respond to? Now, this doesn't mean you should ignore a tool just because it's illuminating more events or more risk in your environment. It's not what I'm talking about. You should be asking the vendors, how will this reduce the amount of time I have to spend in my day doing a certain task? And if the tool's only adding more time, it's probably not a good fit. Ask your vendor the amount of time needed to deploy that tool and then maintain that tool. Don't just take their word for it, though. Your account management team at your vendors do have the ulterior motive of making money. And this isn't a bad thing, but it's only good if what they're selling you will actually help. And during the Persian invasion, the Greeks had to share information. They were all disparate city-states, and most of them didn't even get along. But they had to band together to take on the common enemy. Now, they did this not just by giving time and resources to their military, but they also had to share information with each other. Information sharing between security teams and other departments and companies allows us, as a community of security professionals, to become a stronger force. And I understand that there are some hang-ups and legalities around information sharing, so everyone's situation is going to be different. So let's start with where we can share information. Local security groups such as B-Sides, ISSA, and InfraGuard are great forums for sharing information. Now, this information doesn't necessarily have to be specifics of a breach on your network, although sharing an anonymized version of those indicators of compromise can definitely help. These are great places to share thoughts, theories, and processes that have been on your mind or put into practice. They are good places to get experienced opinion of other security professionals. Again, a lot of us get stuck in our own bubble, so it's good to get input from other groups. And I'm fortunate enough that my talk was selected for this conference because I like to share ideas, but sometimes I can get locked in my own bubble. So this gives me not only that soapbox to stand on and share these ideas, but it allows me to have conversations. By the way, if you come to the happy hour that my company, WITFU, is sponsoring after this, this is a great place for us to have a conversation. It allows me to have conversations about the ideas I'm presenting here, and my ego isn't big enough to not take feedback from you. Uh, this is a talk that I'm starting here, but I'm going to be doing it throughout the country uh, this year. And uh, I, I get public speaking isn't for everyone. And that's fine. It's barely for me. It's meetups like these that give you the opportunity to share information at different levels. And, it only, and with those different levels, those could be with peers, they could be with managers, they could be with vendors. You have multiple groups that you can share that information with. So at WITFU, we work with a law enforcement advisor who's a LAPD major crimes detective. He's been doing that for a long time. He and I have discussed how in law enforcement, they share information, not just in ongoing investigations to help find or prosecute suspects, but also to keep each other safe. They call the safety aspect of this the pre-incident indicators. This would be what it would look like if you had a bird's eye view of a police shooting. Uh, but, and you're able to focus on what that person is doing before they began shooting. What does their body language look like? How do they position themselves? Where did they move? By sharing this information with each other, law enforcement officers are able to reduce their risk in the future. In IT security, we have the benefit of being able to record all of the pre-indicator events. And this would be like the reconnaissance or delivery of an attack. Now, there's a movement in support the sharing of technical security data behind a breach. Uh, this is where we talk about Taxi, sticks, and Cybox. So Taxi is a free and open source uh, or open transport mechanism that standardizes the automation exchange of cyber threat information. What does that mean? Taxi is a set of specifications for sharing threat intel. Cybox provides the structure for representing observables. Simply put, observables are indicators of compromise. STICS is the language used to standardize sharing this information. 
these frameworks provide for anonymizing of that data and sharing and to make it easier to share that information. So here's a pretty good example I found on IBM securityintelligence.com. Helps kind of illustrate the frameworks together. Now, it's important to keep in mind that none of these are a single piece of software. They're things that can be implemented in software that you write or that your vendors use. So first, the logs of the file server. Uh, here's, we're going to walk through this example now. The logs of the file server show an unusually high amount of activity coming from a laptop. So you start your investigation. You notice that a user received an email with the subject invoice and a zip attachment. This is an observable. The attachment is a zip file with an MD5 hash. This is another observable. The zip contains an executable with a different MD5 hash. This is a third observable. Further investigation shows you that if a file seen with a hash of the zip attachment, it indicates the presence of a crypto ransomware that was hidden in a zip archive. This is an indicator. You report that the laptop from the user John Doe was infected at 5.15 p.m. on March 23rd with ransomware XYZ, and that the ransomware was delivered via email. So we're filling out this report with as much information as we can on it. Now, you may want more information on this attack. So you ask your sharing community, and they return that the file is ransomware, that gets weaponized by downloading its payload through HTTP from four different command and control servers located in southern Europe. This is the TTP portion of, of this, uh, or known as techniques and procedures. So you receive an IP watch list. This is an indicator. You add the list of four command and control servers to a block or watch list to detect other infractions. This is the course of action. You can now link the mail description, the MD5, and the IP watch list with this incident. So you want even more information. You go back to the community. You ask for more information on the ransomware's purpose. And you learn that it's known to be the crypto crew using the ransomware family XYZ-A. You now have a threat actor, and you can attribute the incident. The block list reveals there are other infected laptops, all belonging to human resource users. This is an update, uh, updated to the techniques and procedures, so the TTP portion of this. And then we can begin to identify types of victims as well. So we're getting more specific in finding out who this is targeting. So now you can deploy block lists for email attachments with the same MD5 indicators or outgoing HTTP traffic to one of the command and control indicators. So next, government agencies that apply the same indicators have hits for email messages, arriving from users who are part of the human resources department. So we've, now we've narrowed the victims down to a single department. They're going to update the information to reflect that the ransomware is primarily targeted to users and human resources in government agencies. Now we have more to add to the techniques and procedures, and again, are down the victims. So the sharing community reports a similar case in country ZZ with the same deployment characteristics and we can link the incident to a campaign. So now by sharing information, we were able to build much more intelligence into our security program than we initially had. We can tell a stronger story and help others to recognize the, and block the attacks. So in the end, the 300 Spartans did die, but this was after killing thousands of Persian soldiers. However, the bigger picture was that Sparta as a whole, and more importantly, Greece, was not conquered by the Persians. Because of the preparation the Spartans made up front with using the most out of what little they had in the way of efficiencies, training, and then supplementing with the landscape, they became a huge hindrance to the Persians while at the same time becoming infamous. So I want to leave you with this. Let's not look at what we don't have in the way of funding but what we do have in the way of all of the hardworking and intelligent professionals in this room to win our own battles in cybersecurity war. So please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter with the handle Detected Anomaly or email me, Keith at Whitfoo.com. All right, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, otherwise, if you're not comfortable asking in front of everybody, we can discuss over drinks at the happy hour. Yes, sir.
Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, it's just a little, it's slightly harder, right? You have to reverse engineer the commercial code. It's usually obfuscated somehow. That, I, you're absolutely right, though. With, with commercial software, that could, be, that could be exploited as well. It happens all the time. Any other questions? All right, great. Thanks. I'll give you guys 10 minutes back then. <laughs>